Let's open our Bibles to Revelation 1. As you're turning there, I would like to thank all of you that prayed for, for Bonnie and for me as we went down to the Christian Medical Dental Association last week and I spoke. Uh, I had no idea of the magnitude of what they were doing. Now, of course, there's no group that we would entirely agree with anything. In fact, most people don't even agree with each other. So, you know, I'll, I'll admit that. But I will tell you the heart of what they do is that they have 10,000 doctors and those 10,000 doctors are kind of like the last line of defense of personal contact in our culture. Uh, they mentioned that most people don't even answer their cell phones anymore. They don't answer text. I mean, who knows what the next form of communication we are going to have to have is. But they said one thing everybody in America still does is they'll sit in one of those embarrassing little, you know, paper robes, you know, on, perched on the crinkly paper, and they'll look into the eyes of that person they trust that is talking about their life, their doctor. See, people still trust and talk face to face with their doctors. And the average doctor talks to 8,500 individuals a year face to face. And, and part of what the CMDA does is this is a group that has made a pact and a pledge that they are going to do three things. The first one is they raise the flag. They teach them how to raise the flag and, and let it be known in a way that won't bother Blue Cross, Blue Shield, or their medical group, or anybody else they work for, the doctor, that is. The doctor can express that they are a Christian, and they teach them ways to do that. And if the person responds at all to that, then they train them how to plant these little seeds of, uh, they call them seeds of faith. And then, if the person responds to that, they have taught them how to follow up and, and be able to share the gospel with them. And, and I mean, that's just amazing to think that 10,000 doctors meeting with 8,500 individuals do the math. We're talking about about a fourth of our country are touched by these doctors. And so that's amazing in itself. And, and I was talking with the, the 70 leaders, the, the ones who run all the chapters and train and teach the doctors and do all these retreats with them. But what's amazing is what some of the doctors are doing. This morning in the New York Times, it was talking about why America's uh, healthcare is the most expensive in the world. And one of the reasons is how much our procedures cost. You know, a colonoscopy in America, just the colonoscopy, not all the attending stuff, is $1,100. Every other country in the world, it costs two to 300 for the same instrument doing the same awful thing, you know? And uh, <laughs> why does it cost so much? And that's what we're wondering about, how everything just, just mushrooms in cost. But the other side of that is, these doctors were telling, though they're high-income people, one of them, I'll just tell one story, one doctor from Augusta, Georgia, he lives where the master's tournament is, he takes three months out of every year and he goes to Muslim countries and he's gotten permission from the health ministers and he does door to door house calls in places there's no hospital for 500 miles or 100 miles and there's certainly no doctor. And he is uh, an expert in his realm of diseases you get out in the bush and everything and, and his wife goes with him and they spend three months going village after village. They actually live with the people, they go to all the houses, do house calls and, and at the end of their visit there, the people from the village all come to their hut and they say, now we watch television, we know what Americans are like, but you're not like any American we've ever seen on television. Why are you here? Why are you doing this? And we're not even paying you. And they they invite them in and they say, do you really want to know? And the people say, we really want to know. They said, you aren't going to like what we're going to tell you. And they say, we want to know. And that's when they're invited to share the gospel. And they do this village after village after village. And I thought, pay a little more for your colonoscopy if you have a doctor doing something like that. You know what I mean? It's amazing what these front row um, servants of the Lord are doing. So that was a thrill to be a little tiny part of that. But Revelation chapter 1 and verse 3. As we open this morning, remember, we're entering the only book of the Bible that makes a big promise. This is the only book of the Bible that says, if you will read this, listen to what it says, and respond to these words, the God of the universe will bless you. You know, there's a lot of uh, different parts of life that, that we love. 
There is nothing greater than the God of the universe to smile down upon us and say, I am pouring out my blessing on you. And you know what? Every one of us this morning have the opportunity, if we connect by faith to this morning, have that overwhelming awareness of God's blessing on our life. So if you have Revelation 1, 3, God wants to bless each of his servants this morning. And so just opening and following along today with an open and surrendered heart, do you understand? It says, and it isn't just hearing, but it's a willingness to respond. And if you have that heart this morning, as we read this words, these words, then God says, I want to bless you. So now that you have it, let's all stand together. You have Revelation 1, 3 open in front of you. I'm going to read it. Listen to this promise. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Let's bow. Father, you want to bless every one of us who will hear with a regenerated heart of faith and who will respond to what you are telling us in your word. I pray that in a, in a new and a fresh and a very powerful way that each of us today, under the sound of your word being taught, would experience that blessing. And that out of all the different parts of your word we look at this morning and all the different truths we cover, that one of those truths will find a place in our life and that you will pour out your blessing on us responding and keeping those things which you tell us in your word. And may that, that induce greater Christ-likeness as we respond and keep your word. And may we know the joy of loving you with all of our hearts today. Life is hard, but your blessing makes it worth it all. May we experience that today. In the name of Jesus, we ask and receive, and for his glory we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As you're seated, I love God's math. Basically, God says, reads plus hears plus keeps equals blessed by God. That is simplicity. That's what kept the early church going. They said, we're blessed if we read, we're blessed if we hear with a heart that has been illumined and energized and enlightened by the Spirit of God, and we have God's grace so we can keep his word. Well, Revelation is the key book to understand God. It's like the keystone in the arch. It's kind of like the capstone of all. It is the reality of God's plan, and it is his word. This book seals up, concludes, explains. It, it, it gives us an understanding of the whole of what God is doing. It, it finalizes everything that was started in Genesis, finds its completion in the book of the Revelation. It is a very, very deep and transformational book. Well, for just a minute, I want to review where we've been in Revelation, where we are this morning, and where we're going. And the reason for that is that in all the journeys, not only did I do the CMDA, but I also went to Barakel, then I went to Barakel's retreat center in, in Canada and did all these and got bit by blood-sucking black flies, I might add. I really suffered serving the Lord. But uh, in the process of that, there were actually four days where I was totally electronically out of touch. My poor phone just had nothing to do. There was no cell tower, there was no internet, and so I didn't even plug it in. It just sat there and moaned for four days. But when we crossed over the border in the United States, it started shivering and shaking and quaking. And in those four days, I got, I think it was 678 emails alone, who, not counting the texts and the 219 Facebook, whatever those were, and all the other stuff. But in those emails, Two were very interesting. They said, could you help us? We've sat through five years and, and we're not sure where we are and where we're going in Revelation. And, and they said, could you? And I thought, well, why? I type with two fingers. I'll just say where we are and what we do. So here you are. Uh, about 
Two and a half years ago, when we started in 2011, the book of Revelation, this is what I told you. The book is about pleasing God as we head to the end of days. Now, that has a twofold meaning. The world is heading to the end, and all of us are too. All of us, if Jesus does not intervene by coming in the sky, he's going to take us home through the valley of the shadow of death. How do you please God as the world is headed toward the ending and as our life is hurtling toward its ending on earth? That's what Revelation is about. How do you please God as you head to the end of days? Well, the final book of the Bible was sent to us by God. That's how it starts out. It was sent by God the Father through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the final explanation. It kind of ties together what all the epistles said and what all of Christ's teaching in the gospel said and what all of the, the different early church services, what they were taught by the apostles and prophets, how all that fits together into what God expects from us. It's kind of the ultimate expectations. And the flow of Revelation is really simple to see. If you go from verse 3 to verse 19, what I said two and a half years ago is in Revelation 1, 19. And, and some of you weren't here then. And, and some of you weren't listening then. And, and most of you have heard this before and it's already marked in your Bible. But wherever you are, look at the outline God gave. Now this is one of the few books in the Bible God gives an outline inspired in the book. It's kind of like the book of Acts. Remember Acts 1 8, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That's the outline of the book of Acts. Jerusalem, day of Pentecost, then there's persecution, they spread out in Judea, further persecution, they go to Samaria, and then they go to the ends of the earth. That's the outline of the book of Acts. Look at verse 19. This is what the Lord Jesus is speaking, and he tells John, write the things which you have seen, that's chapter 1, the things which are, that's chapter 2 and 3, and the things which will take place after this, that's chapter 4 on. There's the outline. There's a whole book of Revelation from God's perspective. What he is intending to communicate, which should be what we get as we listen to him. So, the things which you have seen, that's the message of chapter 1. And if you remember, that's Jesus Christ showing himself in all his glory as the risen, almighty God, the Son. And the picture, the white hair and all the face like the sun. What he's saying is, Jesus is right now on the ground walking through life with us as his church. He's not up there, he's down here. He met with John on Patmos. He came to John where he was. He is watching over our every move. He has those eyes that can see everything. He never leaves our side. He let John know that even though he was on that island as a prisoner and, and with no hope of ever getting off that island, Jesus was with him. It, it's the, the beautiful message. And, and what the lesson is this, the only hope of surviving to the end of days is walking with Christ. By the way, you know what a lot of the 670 whatever emails were about? You know, my niece died, or, and my uncle died, and my father is having stroke after stroke after stroke, and my, you know what I mean? Life is hard. If, if it's not hard right now, it's coming. Life is hard. And what Jesus says is this, the only hope of surviving, pleasing me to the end of your days, is to learn to walk with me. And that's what he communicated to John. Secondly, look at the second phrase in verse 19. Jesus tells John that God sent to us the things that are. And that's chapter 2 and 3. That's the message from Christ's personal letters to the churches that bear his name. Now remember, Jesus did so many things in seven, sevens. Seven I am's in the Gospel of John, seven sign miracles in the Gospel of John, seven titles of Christ in the first chapter of John's Gospel. The sevens continue. Seven letters Jesus himself wrote. But who did he write them to? He wrote them to the churches that bear his name. And he says, I'm the owner of the church. I purchased it with my blood. And here are the pitfalls, the dangers, the difficulties you're going to face if you're in my church. If you're really born again, this is what you're going to face. Jesus speaks in these two chapters kind of like a coach. Now, we're all familiar. There are life coaches. You know, wealthy people that are titans in business hire life coaches. And a lot of my friends have these. And they're a life coach, and they follow them around, and they look at how they write emails and how they do memos, how they have their staff meetings, how they lead, how they communicate, how they present themselves, uh, and how they operate in front of the board, and how they operate in front of the whatever. Life coaches. 
Then other people that have the money have life trainers. And these people tell you how to eat and work out a little more and you need a little more aerobic this and you need to cut that and you need to get your blood here and, you know, work these muscles so that you can... And they can afford that. And I have friends, they have their trainer and their trainer tells them to do this and they do it. And they, they're the ones that are suntanned and skinny. You know, they have those trainers. If you can afford it and obey them, you know. And, and the life coaches are successful and, and succeed. But Jesus... He says, I'm your coach. He says, I'm right here with you. I want you to know why some team members, some people in my church displease me as their master. And he writes seven letters. And he says, this doesn't please me. And he says, others, if you don't avoid these traps, you are useless to me as your savior. I bought you at a price to glorify me. And when you allow this and this and this into your life, it neutralizes your ability to magnify and to minister for pleasing me. What's the lesson? Well, when we're in Christ church, we have a very specific purpose in life. That's what chapter 2 and 3 is all about. In fact, if there's any part of the Bible that the modern 21st century church should be very well versed in, it's Christ's seven critical diagnostic letters to his church. And and we did those three chapters uh, in a series that that I call Christ's Last Words to His Church. Now, look at the last part of verse 19 of chapter 1. That's the final section of the book, the things which shall be after these things. That's chapters 4 all the way to 22. It's the largest part of this book. And it's a description of the end of days from two perspectives. It goes from heaven's perspectives, four and five, to earth's perspectives, six and seven and eight and nine. And then it goes back to heaven's perspective, 10, and then earth, 11, then heaven's, 12, and then earth, 13. And it's just is flipping all over. It's kind of like, reminds me of the first time when I led a missions trip to Russia to a Bible institute, someone at the church bought me this camera and they said, film the whole thing. And so here I am walking around filming like that and we showed it at church and everyone got motion sick. Because, you know, I didn't have that, that was many years ago, and it didn't have that automatic stabilization factor, you know, and people were going like this and were seasick. You get that way in Revelation if you don't understand heaven, earth, heaven, earth. The camera keeps moving in the chapters as they flow through. So, first we studied Revelation 4 and 5 and witnessed the events surrounding the throne room of the universe, and that I mean, this morning, I was just thrilled watching the little yellow buckets go by and people dropping stuff in and the silver plates, you know, uh, being sent all over. And and you know what I thought about? God is watching that offering because that offering was not being given to the ushers or to the kids, the middle schoolers, or to Calvary Bible Church, or even to the elder or the treasurer or the finance committee. That offering was being given to God. And the throne room of the universe is, all of a sudden we see that God is not only watching everything, he's even collecting our offerings of worship. And he puts them in front of him. He has every prayer ever prayed by any regenerated person that's ever lived. He collects them all. I mean, you think your husband or wife saves everything? God saves everything that is directed to him. And and that throne room of the universe series gave us the details of God explaining what worship is, of what redemption means, why we were redeemed, how he wants us to worship, and how everything operates in heaven. And the lesson of those two chapters is that God wants our worship and he seeks us to focus on him in a life of worship. Kind of like the doctor from Savannah that works nine months so he can have three months off to go with his wife to people that say, I can't believe that you're going to do this for us. And, and that's a life of worship. And it's the same thing any of us can do in any walk of life if we get the picture of what God wants. Now, we're in that next part. Starting in chapter 6 is the longest portion of Revelation all the way to 22. And these chapters richly detail the return of the king. Jesus is the real king. Jesus is the one who came, created the universe, came as the creator and was rejected and killed, murdered. Mankind murdered their maker. 
who was a carpenter, and they, they crucified the creator with carpenter's tools on a cross of wood. I mean, it's so amazing what humanity did to their creator. Well, he's returning, and God explains to us how each event during the tribulation is carefully orchestrated to return the universe to its rightful king. And, and it's just a beautiful flow if you understand the whole chapter 5 title deed and everything that's going on with the Antichrist and everything else. But what I love is this morning's news. I mean, did you read? You know, it, you probably do. The SA-300 missiles, which is the most advanced anti-aircraft missile in the world, Russia is giving those missiles helping Iran to arm Syria to fight and destroy Israel. Did you get those components? Russia helping Iran arm Syria, who is bent on destruction of Israel. Now that is old news. God predicted that 2,600 years ago. In the book of Ezekiel, he said the end of humanity is going to be precipitated by Russia helping Iran arm, and it names the peoples around the nation of Israel intent on destroying them, and that's going to kick off the end. And that's what we're right in the middle of. God, and the lesson is God has decided ahead of time each event that is to come. He's written it down in his word, and every time we see faintly things lining up according to his word, it helps us to realize that God has shown it to us, his people. Well, let's get to chapter 6 in verse 2, because that's where we left off last time before uh, I got bit by all those tsetse flies, you know, in Canada. But uh, chapter 6, verse 2, we're studying one theme. And, and the, verse 2 is, the reason we're taking so long on it, is it's focusing this white horse is a representation of the spirit of the Antichrist, which is this constant desire Satan has to deceive God's creatures into not believing in their creator and to not bowing in submission to their creator and worshiping him. Satan wants to get the creator off their minds and for Satan, the creature, to become the one they worship. And so that, that spirit of the Antichrist has been with us since the Garden of Eden, but it's going to be embodied in a person in the tribulation. And this white horse is representative of the Antichrist. And basically, deception is a reminder we should beware of the angel of light, Satan. That's what Satan is, 2 Corinthians 11. He, is, he transforms himself into an angel of light. When Satan appears to people, he appears as this angel of light. He is warm and caring and positive and welcoming and just making them feel good. God says, if you want to come to me, you will mourn. You will be so aware of your lostness, of your sinfulness, of your rebellion, of your failures, of your falling short of him. The devil says, just be all within you. Let it come out. I accept you just as you are. All I want is you to worship me. God says, no, repent, bow, submit, mourn over your sin, bow in contrition at your abject inability to ever be holy and receive my free offer of total forgiveness, cleansing, and eternal life. Two completely different messages. The angel of light is winning the hearts of the world more and more. The deceiver, the liar, the one who can't abide in the truth is allowed to exert his full power of deception during chapter 6 onward. God allows it. It grants to him if you read verse 2. And God all along is guarding and preserving the truth lovers while the rest of mankind goes with the devil. And that's a thumbnail of the end. That's, that's where we are right now. We're in this titanic confrontation between the God of this world, the deceiver, the liar, the, the dragon, the truth hater, and the God of this universe reaching down and touching and drawing and calling to himself truth lovers, of which we're a part this morning. 
And that's what's going on. And the first seal of verse 2 is the spread of the global lie. And amazingly, the first seal and its white horsemen of deception is an event on God's timetable. And we saw that when we ended last time. 2 Thessalonians 2, the whole section of 2 Thessalonians 2 is written about the fact that truth gets abandoned, we saw, that the Almighty God gets pushed aside. By the way, you want to have a classic example of that? This is a Bible. This is the revealed truth of the infinite God. This is all things that pertain to life and godliness that the God of the universe wants us to know. Do you know what the best-selling Christian books of the last two years have been in America? They have been books, interestingly enough, one of them was written, and I'm not joking, by a guy whose name is Malarkey. Um, Isn't that fitting? But both of them, the two best sellers, one sold nine million, the other sold seven million, are about little people having out-of-body experiences and going to heaven and seeing things that nobody, no Christian has ever heard of before or ever seen in the Bible. And Christians are buying these like, like it's the latest thing from heaven itself. And they're buying these books and they're having Bible study groups and they're all discussing stuff that is not in the Bible that God did not reveal and that aren't true. Did you catch that? If those are truths about heaven that aren't in the Bible, then those books, Malarkey and the other one, are revelations. They are truth directly from God if they're really from heaven. And you know what? They're not because God has stopped writing revelation. So you understand that 16 million Christian books have been sold and distributed and read and discussed that are moving people away from the Bible. What people do in these Bible studies is they say, wow. I mean, in these book studies, they go, wow, well, the Bible doesn't even have that. We're going to study this because that little boy under anesthesia either fantasized or, you know, imagined or was deceived or his father was or the editors were. But whatever is happening over there is moving people away from the Bible. And when you move away from the Bible, you move away from the God of truth. And that's exactly what Paul said is going to be the spirit of this time. And then Satan, 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 10, does his signs and wonder stuff. Now, this is at its height during the tribulation, but this is what Christ warned us today to beware of. Deceivers, antichrist, false prophets, and anybody that makes us move away from the truth of God's word. Well, it says in 2 Thessalonians 2, 11 and 12 that our protection is truth. God sends strong delusion to those who don't love the truth. We love the truth. We feed on the truth. We want to know the truth. The truth sets us free. His truth is what is the sanctifying power of our life that transforms us. And so, Things were so bad, and and I told you this last time, 100 years ago, that a group of Bible scholars 100 years ago, they were conservative Bible-believing, they sat down 100 years ago and addressed the issues of people moving away from the Scriptures 100 years ago. I mean, before they had television, before they had digital devices to distract them, before they had 60-foot-wide Dolby surround technicolor movies to entertain them. A hundred years ago, people were moving away from God and his word in the church. And what they said is they moved away from seven essential doctrines. So they reaffirmed them, and we looked at them last time. Inspiration, that all we know about God is based on his word. We have to be building our lives under the word of God. In other words, it's it's, it's the, the framework that we don't go beyond. A lot of people build their lives on the Word of God. In other words, it's there, but they go everywhere. We need to to get under the the constraints of the Word and doctrine and truth. Secondly, they said doctrine is clear in the Bible about Jesus Christ and his church, and they named specific cults who presented a false gospel. Basically, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Watchtower Society back then, the Mormons, uh, Christian science, spiritism. You say, what is that? Theosophy and spiritism are kind of like Shirley MacLaine, you know, this spirit guide and you take yoga and you get, bend yourself and open yourself up and listen and feel power. And, and that's not new. 
That's as old as the Garden of Eden. Satan says to, to Eve, oh, oh, you, you will know. You don't need God. You will know. It's, it's in you. It'll come out. Yeah, it's called sin. And, and so doctrine is important. Thirdly, depravity. God's word declares the reality of sin. They affirmed 100 years ago that man is not basically good but born a sinner. We need that every generation. We need to be reminded of that. The children are born savages. Now, they might be cute, and you put powder on them and everything, and bows, but they are murderous in their anger. If a little two-year-old could have their way, they would probably kill people if they don't get their cookie or their toy. That's how we're born. It's not culture that makes us that way. It's not the public school system. We were born that way. See, we are born depraved. Fourthly, substitution. God's word only presents biblical salvation is received by faith in the God incarnate Christ Jesus who became sin for us. The only way you're saved, the only way I was saved, was believing that a substitute took my place, bore my punishment, and I reached out in faith to him. And he took upon himself my sin. You know, the, the crosses of Easter are so interesting. There's one in the middle, Jesus Christ, and there's a thief on each side. One thief died with his sin on him. He's the one that cursed and to the end and railed on the other Jesus and the other one. But the other thief died with his sin on Jesus. And so it's interesting, a sinner whose sin was taken, a sinner whose sin was left on him. That's the two types of people in the world. Those who die in their sin and those who die sinners whose sin has been taken unto Christ. And that's what substitution is about. Imputation, God's word teaches us that this salvation Christ purchased cannot be earned at any level. It's dispensed by God, not by any church, not by any cleric, not by any tradition. Not by water, not by incantations, not by holy wafers, not by oil, not by pilgrimage not by the five pillars of Islam. It's only dispensed by God. And the way he dispenses it, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's why the Bible is so important. That's why it's more important than our daily food. That's why we can't live without it, Jesus said. And by the way, 100 years ago, the evangelicals stood shoulder to shoulder and they exposed the errors of Roman Catholicism, they said, and every other religion of human achievement and works righteousness. They stood shoulder to shoulder. Today, you can't find two standing shoulder to shoulder. In fact, our modern missions books declare where the Catholic Church is, that's a reached country. <sighs> reached with what? With with telling people they've got to earn their way to heaven, that they've got to bow to an earthly authority that, that is more authoritative than the word of God? No. No, and, and that's where we've gone in 100 years. Christology, all doctrine starts with Christ and all error starts with some deviation from Christ and they strongly affirm the deity of Christ. And finally, and just before we go into communion, the last thing that they talked about, and I think it'll amaze you, is creationism. And basically, they said, from cover to cover, God's word reveals the creator of the universe described in the Bible, so we stand against the grave errors, they said, of evolutionism and Darwinism. A hundred years ago, they thought, they thought those were grave errors. For just a moment, think about the whole doctrine of creation and what that has to do. By now, you're saying, what does that have to do with Revelation 6 2? Could you remind me? Okay, here's the reminder. Why does biblical creation matter? Five minute dissertation on that. Think about this. You know, sit up and move around a little bit. Try and think about what this means. There is one unifying theme that secularists in our world have that is that the universe is evolutionary, and with enough time, we can achieve limitless levels of advancement. I mean, if we can go from a primordial soup to humans, can you imagine in a billion years what humans will become? That's evolutionary thought. This means to the evolutionist, you don't need a creator, so there's no judge and there's no need of a redeemer. In fact, we're not even sure we're sinners. We just haven't evolved enough. And that's why the doctrine of creation, 
which is this. This is the doctrine of creation. Believing God's account of creation, he wrote down himself in his word instead of mankind's speculations. God, with his own finger, Exodus 20 says, wrote the creation account. And this is what he wrote with his own finger in rock. In six solar 24-hour days, I created the universe and rested the seventh. So you should work your jobs as brick makers in Egypt for six 24-hour days and rest the seventh. That's what he said in Exodus. That's his account. And that's what God says is so important. Now, What does that matter? Well, would it surprise you to know that most evolutionary steeped Americans actually are open to the discovery of some extraterrestrial being types of visitors who are advanced far beyond Earth's technology? Almost every movie is about that. They come from somewhere else, and they have this power source we don't have, and they have food sources we don't have, and if they lose a limb, boop, they get it back. If they die, they are resuscitated. I mean, they have powers that we love to watch on these screens and listen to the pretty music. But according to pollsters, 72% of Americans believe there's life beyond the earth. Now, what does that mean in the light of the word of God? By the way, I wonder how they get those percents. I've never been polled. Have you? I mean, how do they know that? But they know that. Well, basically this, in light of God's word, UFOs would support naturalistic evolution. In other words, evolution has been going on for 16 billion years, but it's been going on in different places at different levels. And those higher forms are powerful, intelligent beings. And if they're out there, they're so advanced that maybe they can help us overcome our bondage to death and disease. Have you ever thought of that? That's really what people think. They think, beep, 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 the radio telescopes are going to get you know, we're going to get a lock on this intergalactic download of everything we need to know to live forever. And the problem is we've already gotten it and they don't like it. See? See, UFOs support naturalistic evolution. When people believe in extraterrestrial intelligence, that would mean evolution has gone on with other intelligent life forms for billions of years somewhere out there and they have ascended higher than we are here on Earth. So... That means these extraterrestrials lessen the incarnation of Jesus. Do you understand what that means? If they're out there, Jesus was just one of them. He's just one of these higher life forms. He's just one of many. Do you know what I just described to you? Mormonism. You understand that? There are other worlds and other gods, and and we're just one of many. And if you join and come to the temple and stick your hand through the hole and get to wear the holy underwear, that you will get your own world somewhere. I mean, isn't that amazingly the lie of the devil? And it's it's a lessening of the incarnation. The erroneous thinking that Satan wants us to believe, his false deceptive lie is that the earth is just an insignificant dot in the universe. Isn't that the way it's presented? Boop. That little blue, green. uh. And then you go. You see it all and you think, we're nothing. There's all that. And we can't wait to find out all the intelligent beings that are out there. And the only one that's out there came here. And he said, man is the crown of my creation. And we are in God's image. And Satan says, you're not in God's image. Satan says, Christ's death was local. It wasn't a cosmic event. It wasn't for the universe. It was just for that little dot. And sin is only our problem. Probably it's not even a problem at all. If you evolve a little more, you won't even have that problem. And hope lies in contact with these higher life forms. And that's why all of this Scientology, Tom Cruise stuff is all, there's a higher life form out there. And if we can just make contact with it, all of our problems will be solved. And God says, the only higher life form, the direction you're going, you're going to get is the angel of light, Satan. And he's going to deceive you. And Satan wants us to think that the word of God is anachronistic, it's local, it's out of touch with the big picture of the cosmos. We should beware of the lies of the deceiver. And all the movies, and all the science fiction, and most of the movie stars are all on this bandwagon of evolutionary, naturalistic, extraterrestrial intelligence ideas. 
And it's the lie of the devil. That's what evolution, science fiction, and UFOlogy teaches. And those lies of Satan are deceiving mankind and thus determining their eternal destiny, that they will be separated forever from the God of the universe who revealed himself, who actually came to live here, who was rejected and crucified for his creations. We need to spread the truth to the perishing every chance we get. We need to hold the truth no matter what is coming down or going on because that's what we are saved to do. And we celebrate this morning the one who is the creator who came here as our redeemer and died in our place. And all of us who have by faith placed our hands on him, he has taken our sins upon himself and has given to us his righteousness. Let's bow before him in prayer. As we bow, just take a moment to focus on the Lord, to thank him for becoming sin for you, for me. And the men are going to prepare to serve us the Lord's Supper, but let's make sure we have clean hands and pure hearts before we touch those precious pictures of Christ. And Father in heaven, we thank you that neither is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. And I pray that we would repent of all known sin in our life, that we would partake of this communion with no unconfessed and unforsaken sin. Because if we will confess and forsake, you're faithful and just to already have forgiven us but the blessing is that you cleanse us. You've told us if we keep your word that we've heard that you will bless us. Bless us with the assurance of your cleansing, with the awareness that you are the God of this universe and that you are the truth and that you've revealed yourself in your word. And may we, on this halfway point of this year, reaffirm our need to not live by bread alone, but by every word from your mouth. Bless this celebration through the partaking of this bread. May we commune with you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.